I'm excited about what the Lord has for us this morning in these particular verses. I think they're, they're verses that cause an awful lot of questions, but also there is tremendous blessing to be found here in Luke chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through verse 23. Last week, however, we looked at Luke 7, verse 11 through 17, when Jesus and his followers met a funeral procession coming out of the village of Nain. You remember, it was kind of the, the convergence of two crowds. One of them was in mourning, mourning the death of a widow's only son. And Jesus looked on this, this woman, he saw her, and he had compassion on her. him. Remember, he said that he, he, he was moved, and he went and he spoke to the dead person, which... I wouldn't do, but I'm not Jesus, and I don't have the power that Jesus does. Jesus said, young man, arise, and the young man did, even from death. And obviously, the, the, the funeral procession on their way out to bury the young man ended up turning around and going back into the city and rejoicing. Verse 17 tells us, and this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea, throughout all the region, Roundabout. Now, I mentioned to you that this is very significant because of where Jesus is. Now, I'm going to get connected here real quick so that we can advance the slides. Jesus is up ministering around Galilee. Okay, now I know this is small. If you need to, you can look at the maps in the back of your Bible as well. Jesus is ministering up in Galilee, up in the north. Judea is the southern region. The southern region that would be on the west side of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Okay, that's where Judea is. And so it's interesting that the Bible goes and says specifically that the, the rumor, the rumor of what Jesus had done to the, the widow's son in name made its way all the way down into Judea. And that's significant because it directly leads us, it kind of segues into what we're looking at today. Because today, the main, the, the main character of interest is actually in Judea, though Jesus is still in Galilee. We're talking, of course, about John the Baptist. We look at verse 18. It says, and the disciples of John, the Bap or of John showed him all these things. This is speaking of John the Baptist. Jesus' cousin, you remember. Uh, he's related to Jesus uh, by his mother, Mary. Uh, Mary and Elizabeth, the mother of John, were, were related. And so Jesus has some relation to John. And John the Baptist is in prison when this, when this is talking about. You remember the circumstances. We talked about them for, for some weeks in Luke 1, that the circumstances that surrounded the birth of of John the Baptist. It's interesting. He was the second person to acknowledge uh, who Christ was. The first would be Mary, his mother, and then John the Baptist, and he was in the womb when he did so. It's interesting. We read about that in Luke 1 41 that Mary walked in and greeted Elizabeth, and, and Elizabeth said, When you called out, the babe within me leapt for joy, which gives us a lot about when life starts, doesn't it, uh, as, as far as that goes. John was in prison because of his bold denunciation of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was a wicked, wicked man. The Herodian dynasty was a wicked, wicked dynasty. Uh, they were known for their lust, for their passion, for their murder, for intrigue. They were everything that you don't want the king of your land to be known for. Herod the Great would have been Antipas' father. Herod the Great was the one who decreed the murder of all the children around Bethlehem right after the birth of Christ. That was, that was Antipas' father. Antip or Herod the Great had many sons with many women. And his sons were obviously related through the father, but they, sometimes they got along well, sometimes they didn't. But there was all sorts of palace intrigue that was going on. One of Herod's sons, Herod the Great's son, his name was Herod Philip, was married to a woman named Herodias. Well, Herodias uh, and her husband, Philip, they had a daughter named Salome. Okay, and, and you're familiar with the story, though it's not recorded for us in Luke. We'll look at it a little bit later. Herod Antipas, however, seduced his brother's wife. Antipas seduced Philip's wife, 
and was living in open adultery with his brother's wife. And, and you can imagine the scandal that this would have brought uh, to this, this time. And everybody would have known about it, and people would have talked about it. And John the Baptist was a man who was not willing to let this slide. And so he stood up, and he spoke about it. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 3, uh, we read, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. True? True, but not popular, particularly with Antipas. Okay? And it is very dangerous, obviously, it always has been, probably always will be, to make kings unhappy. And John the Baptist had done just that. It says, actually goes on to say in Matthew 14, And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude. Because they counted him as a prophet. So Herod Antipas was so angry with John the Baptist that he would have put him to death. He, he was that angry, but he knew that if I kill John, then the people will rise up. Because the people think John is a prophet. What, was John a prophet? Absolutely he was. And we'll see that even today. So John the Baptist sits in prison, likely in Herod's summer palace called Macarius on the eastern shore of the Dead Sea, kind of looks out over the Dead Sea down there in the south, the Judean region, okay? That's significant because remember in verse 17, the news of what Christ is doing in Galilee are making its way down to, down to Judea. And so John's disciples, here in verse 18, John's disciples go and they tell John all about what's happening up north. You remember Jesus? John, uh, well, he's doing all this. And John had doubt. Verse 19. Well, we'll look at it in just a moment. He's sitting there in his cell, certainly less comfortable than our modern cells would be. And John had had a whole lot of time to think. And he'd begun to develop some doubts. And he did exactly what you should do with doubts. He took them to Jesus. He took them to Jesus via his disciples, verse 19. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men that were come unto him, and when, when the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? That's, that's powerful doubt, isn't it? It's interesting because the events of John 1 have already happened. John 1.29 is where we read the next day, John. This is talking about John the Baptist. John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Does that sound like doubt to you? No. No, Matthew 3 records that when Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized of John, we read in, in verse 14, But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. John knew who Jesus was. He publicly identified him in a loud voice, and I'm betting John the Baptist had one. He says, Behold! The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus comes to be baptized of him. And John says, no, no, Lord, this isn't how it should be. I need to be baptized of you. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so. And he baptized him. Shortly after his baptism, Jesus had been standing there in the water. And the Holy Spirit of God descended on him in the form of a dove. The Bible says it lighted or landed on him, and a voice was heard from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And John had been there for that. John had heard the voice from heaven. John had publicly identified Christ. And so it should come as a little bit of a surprise to us here in verse 19 that he conveys a question to Jesus, and the question is, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Isn't that odd? It is. There are a lot of reasons that John might have had these doubts, and, and let's pursue them because there is tremendous application for each and every one of us in this passage. Number one, why, why might John the Baptist have had doubts? Well, his location. He was in prison. 
It's easy for doubts to arise during an especially difficult time of trial or trouble. There's a lot more people who struggle with doubts in the hospital than do at birthday parties. Why? Because you're in a difficult space. You're in a difficult time. Also, it's not just that John was in prison. It's why John was in prison. He, you remember his crime was that he had, his crime, we should put that in quotes, it wasn't a crime at all. His crime, if you want to call it that, was that the, he had publicly decried the sin of a public authority. And he was sitting prison, in, in prison for doing right. He had obeyed God rather than men, and now he was suffering for it. And when that happens, when we suffer for righteousness' sake, it's rough on our worldview. Because we live our entire life under the assumption, if I do good, I'll be blessed. If I do bad, I'll be cursed. And when we do good and bad things happen, it's rough on our worldview, isn't it? It is. It's rough when we're doing the right thing. God, if I'm right, then why is all of this happening to me? God, if I'm doing the right thing, if we're doing the right thing, then why is this happening to my wife or my husband or my kid? Lord, why is it like this? And John, a man, a great man, was in prison and he was having these thoughts. Lord, why? It, and, and it led him to question things that it, it led him to question things that he knew. He had already publicly admitted that Christ was the Messiah. And now he sends messengers to Christ saying, Lord, are you the one? Are you really the one? Or do we wait for another? So number one, he's in prison, his circumstances are less than desirable. Another, another reason that perhaps he was facing doubt is because he was lacking the full picture. In John's preaching, in Matthew 3, verse 11, I'll put it up for you, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus, obviously. He's talking about Jesus, and Jesus had come, and he had been baptized. But John said of Jesus... Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Wow. It was commonly believed among the followers of Jesus that if he was the Messiah, and they hoped he was, that he would come and he would overthrow the Romans and he would lead the Jewish nation into heights of glory yet unseen. And people were waiting for that. You'd say, really? Yeah, even the apostles. Every time that Jesus was, was gaining popularity, the, the disciples would get excited. It's happening. It's happening. And you remember how many times in the Gospels they asked Jesus, when are you going to set up your kingdom? <coughs> like this week, next week, next month? Was what they were wanting. But you know what? It's been 2,000 years and he still hasn't set up his kingdom yet. And so John was lacking some information. John didn't know that there would be a break between the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When did that happen? Pentecost. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. The church was born. So you have Acts chapter 2 when there was a baptism with the Holy Ghost. And the baptism with fire still hasn't happened. When will it happen? When Jesus comes the second time. You see, the first time he came as the Savior, the second time, at his second coming, he'll return as the ruler of earth. And there will be a baptism with fire. We're going to read about that some tonight in Revelation 17. Come on out ne next week, 19, 18 and 19. All talk about the baptism with fire at the second coming of Christ. But John the Baptist didn't see that. He saw two mountain peaks, the baptism with the Spirit, the baptism with fire... But he didn't see the valley that we live in, the valley of the church. That's where we are. And John didn't, he, to him it looked like all the same thing. And to the disciples, they thought, yeah, Jesus is going to come. He'll, he'll be the propitiation for our sins. And then he's going to set up his earthly kingdom. And he didn't. He didn't set up his earthly kingdom yet. And so John is sitting in prison with partial information. And it's hard to act when you've only got part of the information. John the Baptist had likely believed that his imprisonment would be short-lived. Why? Because Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Lamb of God. He's come to take away the sins of the world. I won't be in prison long because soon he'll be in charge. And of course he'll let me out. 
that hadn't happened. John is still sitting in prison with partial information of the baptisms that John spoke of. Again, only the baptism of the Spirit has happened even today. In Luke chapter 3, verse 7, 17, I'm sorry, it says, he, John is talking again. He says, whose fan is in his hand. He's talking about Jesus. He says, his, whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire and quench. You get the fact that John the Baptist was a fiery preacher? I get that. He, he talks like that, but it hadn't happened. It hadn't happened at Christ's first coming. And here John, John the Baptist, is sitting in prison for doing right. He's, he did the right thing. If he had it to do over again, he should have done exactly what he did. And he's sitting in prison because he has a bad, a bad set of circumstances and partial information. And here's another reason, another possibility, and I don't know, but possible. John was now out of the spotlight. Now, I'm not casting aspersion on John the Baptist. In just a few moments, next week actually, we'll look in verse 28. Look ahead at it, though, and we'll read it. This is what Jesus had to say about John the Baptist. Okay, He pays him a tremendously high compliment. He says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. He that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than we. Okay? I'm not casting shade on John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a, was a great man. I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven one day. John the Baptist understood. But John had been the focus of attention prior to Christ's ministry. Prior to Jesus, there had been, there had been much talk about John the Baptist. He's this guy who's down at the Jordan River. He looks strange. You remember the description of John the Baptist? He was robed in camel's hair. He had a weird diet. He ate locusts and wild honey. He was, he was just a rugged individual who's down there, and he's baptizing people unto repentance in the Jordan. And everybody had talked about him, and people had come from far and wide to meet and hear from John the Baptist. And then Jesus came on the scene, and what happened to John's followers? Greatly decreased. Greatly decreased. Obviously, he still had a few disciples. They're the people who went to talk to Jesus for him. But his following, the noise around John the Baptist, had suddenly grown quiet. And now, as he sits in a prison cell on, on Herod's palace, it's very quiet. And a dramatic shift from the spotlight to the closet will make a big difference in what's going on in your mind, won't it? When you have a sudden change, all this noise is being made about John. Suddenly, none of the noise is being made about John. It's all about Jesus. He's up there in Galilee raising people from the dead. All John did was he, he just dumped people in the Jordan. And, and it probably would have been a tremendous change of pace for John. John finds himself dealing with two great foes of certainty, dark and quiet. Dark and quiet or rough as it can be. He'd have plenty of both of these in the dungeons of Mercurius there. But Jesus responds to his question. Verse 21. It's interesting that Jesus, immediately following their question, he didn't immediately answer them. He continued on with his normal activity. It says, and in that same hour, the same hour in which he was asked the question, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And, and unto them that were blind, he gave sight. So they walk up, and you know there was a crowd around Jesus. There was always a crowd around Jesus. And John's disciples walk up, and they, they come into Jesus' presence, these two men. They say, Lord, John wants us to ask, are you the one, or are we waiting for someone else? And Jesus, it's almost as if he goes, and then he goes on healing people and, 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 and casting out demons and, and changing lives all around him. Jesus completes a handful of miracles and turns to the disciples of John. And in answer to their question, in verse 22, we read, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the, left, 
the, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. This is very interesting. This breaks precedent with what Jesus usually does. Okay? Usually, when people come to Jesus and they want a sign, he doesn't give it to them. As a matter of fact, we have it recorded for us. Why don't you keep your finger here in Luke 6, or Luke 7, and turn back to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. The religious leaders came to Jesus, and they wanted him to perform a miracle for them. We, we want to see one of these tricks that you do, basically what they're asking. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. I'm going to start reading you can, you, as you find it. It says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. These are the religious leaders. Okay? But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? A little bit. Here the religious leaders come and they want to see it. They want to see a magic trick is basically what it amounts to. They come, Jesus, we'd like to see, we'd like to see one of your miracles. We want to see a sign. And Jesus said an evil and an adulterous generation is what looks for signs. And I'm not going to give you a sign. The sign will be the sign of Jonah. That Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale and so shall the son of man. And, hmm, that, that would have been harsh for the religious leaders, wouldn't it? The religious leaders weren't coming with honest questions. They were coming in unbelief. We don't believe who you are, but we'd love to see one of your magic tricks. John, you can turn back here to Luke 7. John was coming from a place of struggling belief. He wasn't coming saying, Lord, I don't believe you, so, so prove it. He had come, and he hadn't asked for a sign, but Jesus gave one instead. When John's disciples asked the question, Jesus sent them back, and he said, tell John all that you've seen. You've seen all these miracles. There's blind people who can see. There's lame people who can walk. There are dead people who are alive again. You, you go tell John what's going on here. John's question coming from a place of struggling belief. In Mark chapter 9, verse 24, the father of a demon-possessed boy put it this way. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. He's coming from a place of, he wants to believe. He has a desire to believe. He's really struggling because he's sitting in jail for doing what's right. He's been suddenly yanked out of the spotlight and surrounded by his own thoughts. And he doesn't have all the information about what's going on with the baptism of the spirit and the baptism of fire. And he's confused about it. And he's in a dark place of doubt. And so Jesus performs these miracles, sends the disciples back to John. And they go back to John and they inform him of what they'd seen. Something to the effect, John, only the Messiah can do what Jesus does. John, uh, you were right. Jesus does have the power of life and death. He is truly the Son of God. That would have been something like what they were telling him. John, John, he's the one. We're not waiting for another. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. But before they got back, Jesus gave them a parting word in verse 23. This is another fascinating facet of this story. Almost seems to be like Jesus added this as the disciples were walking away. Almost for the benefit of those who had heard their conversation. It says, verse 23, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. The word offend is the word scandalizo. Do you hear a word in there that you're familiar with? Scandal. Scandal. Meaning to trip up, to put a stumbling block before, to cause to fall away. All of the reasons that John was struggling with doubt, his current situation in prison, his lack of understanding God's timeline, the quiet place he now inhabited, being out of the spotlight, were all stumbling blocks. And he tripped a little bit. He, he'd stumbled. Some commentators understand this as a rebuke. John had stumbled. He'd expected Messiah to come and free him from his unjust imprisonment. And, and, and maybe John's a little bit upset. I, I don't know that. And given what Jesus says later in the chapter, I kind of doubt it. 
I don't, I don't think this is Jesus sending a strong rebuke to John. Some view this as an exhortation. Jesus is exhorting John to keep the faith. In the midst of a dark time, in the midst of a, of a, a literal dungeon, John, keep the faith. C.G. Moore, a commentator, says of this, I know of no hours more trying to faith, to, to faith than those in which Jesus multiplies evidence of his power and does not use it. There is need of much grace when the messengers come back saying, yes, he has all the power and is all that you've thought, but he's not said a word about taking you out of prison. No explanation. Faith nourished, prison doors left closed. And then the message, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. That's all. It is hard, isn't it? When you know that Jesus could heal, when you know that Jesus could do something and he doesn't. And, and, and we are told here, keep the faith anyway. They haven't made the sickness that Jesus can't heal, but he doesn't always heal, does he? And it's tough on our faith. It, it causes doubt. It, it causes those, those dark nights where we're laying there looking up at the ceiling and we think, I wonder if all this is right anyway. I, I, wonder, if, I wonder if we're on the right track. If John the Baptist, who Jesus said, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If John the Baptist can have those struggles, do you think we can too? We will. If, if you've lived here on planet Earth long enough, you have, and you will again if you live longer. It's just the way that we're made. We struggle with these things. John the Baptist's story is not completed for us here in Luke. If you want to, and I would encourage you to, this afternoon go home, read Matthew 14. It was Herod Antipas' birthday. Herodias, the woman with whom he was living in sin, sent her daughter, Salome, in, and she danced before him. And in an attempt to show off, Herod told her that she could have anything she wanted. She pleased him so much with her dance. He said, you can have anything you want as a reward. And she'd gone to her mother. Herodias had told Salome, go to, go to Herod and ask for John the Baptist's head on a silver plate. And she had done so. Herod had been hesitant at first, but unwilling to lose face. In front of his friends, he sent and had John the Baptist beheaded in prison, and his head was given to this wicked woman and her dog. And John's disciples came, collected his body, buried it, and returned to tell, to tell Jesus. You realize what this means, don't you? It means John the Baptist died in the dark. But, I'll bet his faith was built because of what Christ had said to him. It's not a guarantee that God's always going to break through for you in your particular situation and heal everybody. We ask for that, don't we? We've got a prayer list, and it's got a lot of people on it, and we pray, we say, Lord, heal so-and-so. And sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he takes them. Sometimes, sometimes he allows them to live on for his glory. Next week, we're going to hear more about what John the Baptist was to Jesus. We'll look at that. But first, what about doubt? Let's, let's bring some application because I know that this is where all of us live. I know maybe there's some of you here this morning. You, you look nice and you really do, but maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, you, you can't see the doubt that's plaguing me right now. And if John the Baptist, a man who had seen and publicly identified Christ. He had heard the voice of God Almighty saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And if John the Baptist could struggle with doubt, then we who live by faith certainly will as well. Doubt comes to us in a multitude of ways. Lots of different types of questions. Am I really saved? Could God really intend for my life to be like this? Why am I alone? Why is this trial happening to me? What if the Bible is just made up? What if we're wrong about this? What if the world's right? What if, what if the real goal is grab all the gusto you can get? What if that's really what it's all about? Questions like that do come. They come inevitably to all. 
especially in times of trial, especially when it's dark, especially when it's quiet in your life, these questions arise and doubts come. Doubts come to us at the same time as John the Baptist. Maybe you found it to be the case in your life during times of trial, when you're at the hospital with a loved one, or when you're in the hospital yourself. Doubts arise after a major change in life. You get married. You lose someone. You have a child. Any number of things like this lead to doubt. Doubts arise when we don't understand what God is doing. And we have it on God's word that we won't understand what he's doing most of the time. He says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You can't attain to them. And doubts come when we don't understand. We, when we don't have the big picture, it's easy. You remember as a child asking your parents, why? And your parents would say, because, because I said so. And you know that your parents had more information than they were sharing with you. And God has more information than he's sharing with us. But when we are operating in this life on partial information, it's easy for doubts to crop up, isn't it? Doubts arise in the dark and quiet places of our life. And we should deal with doubts the same way John the Baptist did. What did he do? He couldn't go to Jesus himself, so he sent his disciples to Jesus. He took his doubts to Jesus. And Jesus isn't sitting in Galilee today. Jesus isn't sitting in Israel healing people. Instead, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he lives in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. You take your doubts to Jesus because you'll have them. You'll have doubts from time to time. And you have something that the disciples at this point in their life could not fathom. You mean to tell me that Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, is going to live in me? Really? They couldn't, have, they couldn't have believed it. David, as close as he was to God, wouldn't have understood. Moses talked with God. Abraham was the friend of God. And they didn't understand what you and I have if we trusted Christ as our Savior. We have the Holy Spirit living inside. So when doubts arise, take them to Jesus. Take them to Jesus. Talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. Don't post it on social media. Call me. Call my wife. Call somebody who you know walks with God and say, I'm struggling right now. Because doubts abound when you're alone in the dark. And they tend to fade a bit when you bring them into the light. When you talk to somebody about them. When you say, look, I'm... I, I know what the Bible says. I'm just really struggling with it. I, I've been there. I've been down that road. I know how dark it is. But you know what I did? I went to the Lord. I went for me. It was my father who was also my pastor. And I sat down with my dad. I said, Dad, I know what the Bible says. But I'm struggling with it right now. I'm struggling to believe any of it. Lord, I'm, I'm having some doubts. And, and when you get them out in the light, talk to somebody. Don't suffer in doubt alone. It's not needful. It's not necessary. There are those who would love to talk with you. All of you have my number if you have a bulletin. Give me a call. If you're struggling with doubt, don't do it by yourself. Don't doubt in the dark what God has showed you in the light. This would be a good one to write down in some way. Don't doubt in the dark what God has showed you in the light. Don't make life-altering decisions when you're struggling with doubt. When you're, when you're sitting there and you're laying there, you're, you're laying in your bed at night, you're looking up at your ceiling and you're plagued with doubts, you can't sleep, and it's eating you alive from the inside out, that's not the time for you to make major life-changing decisions. You need clarity. You need God's light on your decisions. Don't make them when you're in the darkness of doubt. Don't try to, don't try to change everything when you're struggling with doubt. When, you, when, you, when your foundation is not solid, that's not the time to work on the roof. That's the time to work on the foundation. The foundation can be made sure. On this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, Forever. He'll always be the same. He's always there. He's never going to have, have problems, but sometimes we do. We have doubts. 
Psalm 111, verse 7 says, The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. God has used this verse in an amazing way in my life. God has used this principle in my life. When you are Get, when you're looking through eyes of doubt and you're struggling, and, and you will from time to time when you're struggling, understand that God is not the author of that struggle. That God is still in the same place. He's still solid. He's still sure. We sing the song, Will Your Anchor Hold? The answer, if you're a believer and your anchor is Christ, absolutely. Come what may, the world can't shift Christ. And, and the doubts that we have, the waves of doubt, as it were, that come over us from time to time, they're not going to move the foundation that we have of Christ. They can't. And so, so when you find yourself in these times of trial and testing, unrest and doubt, it's not the time to start questioning all the decisions that God has given you peace about and guidance in. I, I, I doubt if I should do this. If God gave you peace to make the decision, if you made a decision according to God's will, when you're facing doubts, is not the time to backtrack. It's the time to take your doubts to Jesus. Take your doubts to someone who you know walks with God. Help them, allow them to help you walk through them. Get clarity and walk with God. In spite of the fact that you have doubts, and you will sometimes. If John could, we certainly will. But my encouragement to you this morning, and like I said, all of you look nice this morning, but there's hope beyond doubt. And I know that some, some of you, maybe you struggle with it now. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, and when you sit here and we're singing these songs about I know who holds tomorrow, you have a greasy feeling in the pit of your stomach because you have doubts. And you think, I don't know. I don't know, but if, Pastor, if, if I could tell you some of what's happened in my life, I, I don't need to know all the details. If you'd like to talk to me, I'd love to listen. But I don't need to know all the details about how rough your life has been. I know a Savior who can do it all. And He's solid and He's sure. All the, all the words of Christ, the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. God is not the author of confusion. The doubts that you face and the trials that you're in will come to pass. We just sang until the storm passes over. What, what do you do when the storm is on you? You get close to Jesus, understanding that he'll stand by. In just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. We're going to sing, I changed it after I had printed the bulletin, so it's not the invitation in your bulletin. We're going to sing, Trusting Jesus. You know this song, probably. Let me read some of the verses to you. I want you to listen. In light of what we've just said about doubt, in light of what we've just said about the surety that we can have in Christ, the song says, simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. Brightly doth his spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. While he leads, I cannot fall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Singing if my way be clear, praying if the path be drear, if in danger for him call, trusting Jesus, that is all. There are likely some here this morning who are in the midst of a trial. While you haven't told anybody about it, you're struggling with doubt. You're here and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Why? Why is it this way? Are we right? Is the Bible really the word of God? Am I saved? If, if it's, it, does God intend for it to be like this? Those doubts. I'd like to challenge you. I don't do this often. I'm not going to start doing it often. But in just a moment, I'm going to pray, we're going to stand, we're going to sing. And I would encourage you, if you're struggling with doubt this morning, if you, you'd say, you know what, um, that's, that's where I'm at. I'd encourage you, come down here, you can, can sit in one of the front pews, you can kneel down here at the front. And it won't do anything magical for you, honestly. It, it, won't, it won't fix all the problems, it won't take all the doubt away. But what it will do is, you say, well, if people see me, they'll, they'll know that I struggle. 
I, I assume that all of us struggle because we're all made out of the same stuff. Okay? What it will do is you come down and we'll pray with you. And so you, you'll suddenly multiply the prayers. I, if you don't come, I won't think less of you. But I do want to give you the opportunity. If, if this, this morning, has really spoken to your heart about the doubts that you face, and maybe, maybe you've hidden for a long time, I'd encourage you. Come on down and, and pray. If you'd like to pray with somebody, I'll pray with you. But we'll all be praying for one another because... Truth be told, if, if I were to go and I were to say, has this ever, if I were to go to each and every one of you, has this ever been an issue at all? I'm betting most, if not all, in this room would say yes. At some point in my life, I've struggled. So it's not something, you're not unusual if you struggle. It means, means that you're just like everyone else. You're just like John the Baptist who struggled with doubts. There's hope beyond doubt. It's found in Christ. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you that it records the truth about the characters that are found in it. John the Baptist was a great man who we look forward to meeting, but he wasn't perfect. He struggled. He struggled with doubt. Lord, I pray that if there's one here this morning who is struggling right now, and, and nobody knows it, Lord, we'd have no way of knowing it. But Lord, if there's one here this morning who's struggling with doubt, I pray that they would, would come, that they talk to somebody, that they pray, that they take it to you, and that they would understand that there is hope. There's life beyond doubt. Lord, I pray you'd be with each and every one here this morning. Pray you'd be with us. Help us to do your will, even now during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name.